Okay, we've got tech support. Yay. Um, okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, okay, so welcome everyone to our fourth episode of season three of the Enteric Disease Investigator Collaborative. Our topic today is Food History 201, which I'm excited about. Um, it's going to be building off of other trainings we've done about how to get a food history and get a little bit more in depth of some skills to be able to do that. Um, so just a reminder to keep your phone on mute. And um, if you're far from your computer, you may consider calling in on a phone if that makes more sense, or just make sure that when you're talking, um, speak up if you're far from the computer so we can make sure to hear everybody. Um, it, it can be helpful to kind of wave at us if you have a question. Um, <coughs> excuse me, in case it takes a second to get off mute. Um, all right, well, we're gonna go ahead and get into um, attendance, see who's here, and our icebreaker question today is, what is the best April Fool's Day prank you've seen or done to someone? So if you could give us your name, your role in your agency, and then tell us what your be the best April Fool's Day prank that you've um, heard about or that you've, you've done to someone. I'm Mary Lee Kellis. I'm the outbreak epidemiologist at ADHS and a part of our foodborne disease epi team. And uh, the best April Fool's day prank that I've heard about is um, a, a group of prankers came to a co-worker's office while that person wasn't there and wrapped everything in wrapping paper, like everything, every book, the phone, the desk, the chair, everything. So when that person came, everything was wrapped in paper, um, in wrapping paper. So I thought that was pretty funny and harmless and, and fun. Okay, so I'm just going to go around my screen and call people off. Um, so if you could let us know your name, your agency, your role, and April Fool's Day prank. Let's start with Brenna. Hello. Um, my name is Brenna Garrett. I work here at ADHS with the food team. Um, and I think, I don't actually think this was an April Fool's prank, um, but it's the only one I can remember right now is, and, and related to Easter, was uh, when we were little, me and my sibling used to get Easter baskets. and I like we used to go youngest to oldest in order of opening things so my siblings before me because I am the oldest all were opening their stuff and in their eggs was like candy or money um, and then in mine was rocks <laughs> so I I didn't think it was very funny that was that was my my father's idea of a joke um, but yes that was probably the best prank I could think of <laughs> rocks in your Easter eggs that sounds awesome poor kid um, let's go on to Mackenzie. Uh, my name is Mackenzie. I'm a foodborne epi at ADHS. Um, I don't know if this is a particularly good um, prank. I don't really usually do them. Uh, but Mary Lee reminded me, we had a, in Florida, I had a coworker who was Jewish and who would get, he would tolerate our Christmas decorations around Christmas time, but was just sort of like, I don't know why we have to do this. And, and was sort of a, a grump about it and so for April Fool's Day we pulled out all the Christmas decorations we used for the office and covered his office in Christmas decor um, which he laughed at he would had a good good spirit about it but it was a lot of fun for us that's awesome okay let's move on to Elfrida um I will honestly I'm not a bank person, so I don't really have any, I've not done any thanks to anybody before, so sorry. Fair enough. Tell us your agency and what you do, what your role is there. I'm Alfreda Bizahalani. I'm the infection preventionist at Tuba City Regional Healthcare. And I confess I'm not really a prankster either. So. Yeah. Okay. All right, Caitlin. Hi guys, I am one of the foodborne epis here at ADHS. Um, this wasn't my favorite prank, but in college I used to live with my brother and uh, he thought, I'm also very anal about being on time. Um, so I, I was getting ready and leaving for work and for whatever reason my key wasn't fitting into my car 
And I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I was so scattered and like, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late. So I went into the house to get his keys and asked him if I could take his car. And then his car key wasn't fitting in his car. He had switched them and just thought it was the greatest thing ever, even though it made my blood pressure skyrocket because I thought I was going to be late for work. <laughs> Brothers, gotta love them. Okay, Ginny. You're on mute, okay. Jenny. Yes, now I'm good. I was like, it wasn't working. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ginny, and I'm a disease investigator here with the food team. Um, I'm not really much of a prankster. I'm trying to um, think of some times or some things that either were done to me. Uh, the only one that comes to mind, it wasn't during April's fool, Fools, but it's the only one I can think of right, right now. When I was traveling, in China with my fiance. Uh, we went to a restaurant with some friends and my friends thought, um, I knew they were, I was in on the joke, I knew they were joking, but they thought it'd be funny to tell my fiance that one of the dishes um, that was served to us at the restaurant was his dog. And he, he, he bought it and he was like super scared. He's like, he got really flustered and um, upset, but he was like trying to be respectful because um, he had heard that that is something that people eat in that part of the world. But eventually, you know, they told him it was a joke. It was just chicken. And, <laughs> um, but that was the only thing that could come to my mind. Um, it was his first time overseas, so he was a little overwhelmed. <laughs> but yeah. Understandably. Yeah. Okay, well, cool. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. All right, Debbie Williams. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I have a few. Um... Let's see, a good one is we went to Iowa and I had just watched a show, um, Wheel of Fortune. And we started to watch it down there and it's like, oh, I realized I've seen it. So I was just playing along and like a word would come on and one letter would turn and I would get it right. And they were so impressed. They go, oh, you need to go on the show. And then I'm like, oh, I just seen this. So sorry, <laughs> fooled them. That's awesome. That's a great one. Um, Debbie, what's your agency and what's your role there? Oh, I work for Mojave County and I am a public health nurse. Okay. And any chance you could maybe adjust your camera so we can see your face? If it doesn't work out, that's okay. I know sometimes oh. cameras are hard to adjust, but if, you, if you'd like, that'd be great. And let's I think go ahead and move. Oh, there we go. That looks oh. a lot better. Hi, Debbie. Hi. <laughs> hey, all right. Let's move on to Nick. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm with Pinal County. I'm a CDI and best prank I've ever done. I convinced my sister that her car was stolen by moving it five spaces over in a parking lot. <laughs> Again, a sibling, uh, a sibling prank. Love it. Let's go on to Martha. Okay, there we go. So this wasn't even something intentional that happened and it was actually recently. I was eating a saladito, which if you guys don't know what that means, it's like a dried prune and it's like really sour. Anyway, so I was eating it, I didn't eat it all. And so I left it like in the nightstand. <laughs> I'm still laughing about it because it's hilarious. And my husband comes into the room and he just picks it up and puts it in his mouth, like not knowing that like I had already like, like put it in my mouth and everything. <laughs> he realizes that it's like, like he realizes that it, obviously I had, I was eating it. And so like, he just made like this crazy face, but it's so funny because he ends up eating it anyways. So it wasn't intentional but it was hilarious. Oh, that's funny. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Who do we have with us from Coconino County today? Oh, 
Sorry, we have to awkwardly run and unmute it. Um, I'm Jonica. I'm the Communicable Disease Admin here at Coconino County. And I would say the best prank that I heard of was in and out shared on Facebook that they added all these toppings and things to their menu, but they really didn't. And people were commenting, like tagging their best friend, like, oh, we gotta go. And it was make a whole joke when they shared it like eight hours later that it was a joke. But I thought it was pretty funny. And I'm Celia, I'm the Communicable Disease Associate here at the county. And I think the best one I heard of from this April Fool's Day was since it's almost Easter, some parents were telling their kids that they had Easter eggs. And so the kids were looking around, but they didn't find anything, so the parents didn't find any eggs. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go on to Erica. Hi, um, I'm Erica. I'm with the University of Arizona SAFER team. I'm the lab coordinator there. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't think of a April Fool's joke, so I cheated and I went on Google and realized that something I saw this year was an April Fool's joke. It was from REI and it was, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's called the REI Zip All. And so basically you can like zip off different parts of this jumpsuit. And I was like, oh, that's really weird. Who would ever wear that? Like that's, it looks ridiculous. And come to find out it was a joke, so. I think I saw that same one. And I think a couple of people thought it was real, including possibly me for a few minutes. Yeah. I've seen some weird things that people wear. Okay, let's move on to Demetria. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Demetria Carr, and I am also with the SAFER team at University of Arizona, and also an MPH student. And I can't think of any uh, April Fool's jokes I did, but I heard about one where someone took candy and caramel covered apples to work. Uh, but when people started biting into them, they were candy and caramel covered onions. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was pretty. <laughs> Funny for the people not taking a bite. <laughs> I like food related pranks. It's funny <laughs> to me. Yeah. Um, all right, let's hear from Alicia and Mireya. Hi, my name is Mireya Lopez. I'm a public health nurse. Um, I, I used to work at hospice um, before here, and six of our nurses, we got together and called in sick on. April Fool's Day, and so my supervisor was not very happy with all of us, but we thought it was funny. We gave it a try. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alicia Gonzalez, public health nurse. Um, I can't really think of one. <laughs> um, I think the funniest uh, that I thought was funny that I saw on uh, Facebook was, um, I like, um, I don't know if anybody likes Tool, the band Tool. And um, I guess um, it's always been a big thing, like, because they take forever to come out with their albums. So I think they, they posted something saying that they were going to come out with a new album and people went all crazy and the fans get crazy. So I thought it was funny. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. All right, Lisa. Can you hear me? Um, yes. probably the best one that I did was able to come up with myself. I sent a disease investigation report to one of our other sites for a um, confirmed measles case on a student in one of the largest schools in their town. Um, they believed it for probably a good five hours, so fortunately they were in a different site than me, but it caused some um, ruffled, it was brand new nurse, so. Kind of broke her in. Wow, yeah, that's one way to um, practice public health uh, mm -hmm. skills, huh? Some preparedness yes. activities going on. <laughs> awesome. All right, um, it looks like Maricopa County has stepped out of the room, so we'll come back to them. Um, Siona is on. Can you introduce yourself and let us know if, if you have a best April Fool's Day prank you've seen or heard? <laughs> okay, I joined late, so I hadn't thought of an April Fool's Day prank. But I'm Siona Willen, the Director of Public Health Nursing here at San Hudson Medical Center in Fort Pines, Arizona. 
Welcome. Thank you. And um, Edwin. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Great. Okay. I know you can hear me, but I can't see me today, even though I'm I'm going through the browser uh, to, to try and see everyone else because I wasn't able to until now. Um, so at my previous job, um, we would we would do sort of a gag thing for people's birthdays. So some of the staff would get together and uh, come up with some idea to try and uh, and put this person on the spot or just turn their office upside down. So in one case, we went ahead and uh, and purchased a, uh, a set of about 120 googly eyes and placed them all throughout a co-worker's office. And then I put a post-it note that had a picture of the uh, the, uh, the little puppet from Saul, and it says something in regards to there's 120 eyes out there. Go ahead and find them kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like Edwin is fun to have as a coworker, likes to look for fun. Okay. Um, do we have uh, Maricopa County in the room? I'm not sure if they're just outside the reach of the camera. You might have had to step off for a while. Um, well, we have as our tech support today, Jordan. Jordan, if you want to introduce yourself, and then if you have uh, an April Fool's Day prank you want to share, that's fine, but if not, that's okay too. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jordan. Um, I don't have one that I've done. Um, I do remember one time as I was a, when I was a kid, my dad said, everyone wake up, there's a cow out in the backyard, and I was like six, so this was the most exciting thing possible to me. Of course, there is no cow. And so I've never had a great appreciation for April Fool's Day pranks because they just get your hopes up. <laughs> well, we've had quite the mix of pranks, um, work-related, family-related, some harmless, some maybe caused a little more harm, like from your six-year-old self, never being able to see that cow that you wanted to see. <laughs> Um, okay, well, let's go ahead and move into our um, our topic. Our guest speaker today is Caitlin, so I'll hand it over to you to take it from here. Hi, guys. Uh, well, I will say um, I did grow up with cows in my backyard, and Jordan, I promise you're not missing very much. Um, they don't smell too great. <laughs> so uh, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't let that ruin your April Fool's. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to be talking to you guys about a food history 201. Um, and I really hope that we can all just sh share some strategies together. Um, I don't want to talk at you too much. Um, but I, I would like to start off with saying that we know that interviewing is hard. As interviewers, we have to be so many things at one time, whether that's gathering information, or trying to be empathetic towards our case, or sometimes we have to be the enforcer and exclude people from work or school, and it can be really hard to balance all of those things to get a great food history. Um, I think that when we have, I'm sure in all of our experience in interviewing, we've come across the type of person where you run down you know, through restaurants, fast food, cafeterias, and they didn't eat out anywhere. And then you run down the pointed foods. They didn't eat fresh salsa. They didn't eat fruit. They didn't eat vegetables. They didn't eat chicken or ground beef or any, anything. They didn't eat anything. And then when you ask them, well, what did you eat? They say, I don't know. I'm like, okay, come on. You have to be eating something. You're alive. Um, and I mean, coincidentally, we were talking about this yesterday and on fasting and, and I know personally, I could, I could never not eat. So, and like you guys are putting something in your body and it's really frustrating and you're almost like pulling teeth to try and get this information. And when I first started doing these interviews, I would get so frustrated and so worked up. I'm not getting a great food history or anything at all. Um, so a strategy that I found that really works for me is it's just taking the time to listen from the time you introduce yourself through the time the patient's talking, talking to you about their symptoms. Um, I find that listening to how they talk about themselves or even talk about their symptoms um, gives you insight into how they organize their thoughts. So for example, when I, a lot of times when I talk to a mom, um, she'll talk about her routine or her symptoms kind of surrounding her, 
her kids' schedules or her husband's schedule. Um, it's never really about her. And so I'm able to ask them, okay, well, you said you got sick a day after taking your son to basketball practice or football practice or, or baseball practice. Um, what did you guys maybe do for dinner that night or do for lunch that day? Um, kind of, you know, put it in terms that she's willing to think about. Um, I find that helps a lot. Also, uh, when you get an elderly patient, I find that they're really great at remembering their doctor's appointments or some standing um, social event that they have. So I always really like to turn it around and put it on them. Like, okay, you said you went to your kidney doctor two days ago. Well, let's see, what did you do right after the doctor? Do you remember what you did for food the day after you went to the doctor? Um, so finding things like that or just really taking note when they're talking to you about um, their symptoms helps so much when trying to get that food history. And I, I know we've talked about it in the past, but by no means do you need to go in order of the questionnaire. So when you're listening to your case talk about their symptoms or talk about some, some things that they were doing before they started getting sick, you can jump around. I find that when you can hear a case talk about their routine, it might be a little bit easier to jump straight to the five-day food history. Um, and people always remember what they ate right before they got sick. So, you know, if they're really insistent, this meal made me sick, I like to let them go ahead and tell me what they ate that day before they got sick. But then just right away, I'll ask them, okay, well, hey, what did you eat the day before? Um, so backtracking that way seems to help a lot. Um, I do find that when you get a case that's a little bit more tight-lipped or reserved and isn't so willing to share their experience with you, I find that's when the five-day food history helps, or excuse me, the pointed foods help a lot. Um, just gets the juices flowing and rattles their brain just a little bit. Um, I also really like to use, uh, I, my fault, I always fall back on specialty nights. I'm sure everyone here that hears me interviewing, I always ask, okay, well, did you maybe go to like a taco Tuesday or a pizza night or a wing night? Um, so noting nights like those really tends to help a lot. Um, because not everyone likes to cook every day of the week. I mean, I certainly don't. Um, and then I always really try to be aware of the events going on around town. So I think it, it's a little bit easier when you're focusing on one county. I know here at ADHS, we do a couple different counties. So I try to stay up on events, whether it's a sporting event, do we have, um, you know, are the Diamondbacks in town? Or is there a football game going on? Um, is there a food, I feel like we always have a food festival going on around town, whether it's food trucks, or I know there was a mac and cheese festival that I really wish I would have gone to. Um, but I really like to take note of these events going around town, um, just to be able to ask and, you know, get them thinking about, well, what did they do over the weekend? Um, I know recently, if you're familiar with Pima County, they have their rodeo event that is pretty big. Um, so I was able to ask my cases in Pima County if they happened to attend this rodeo and if they ate anything there. And that was really helpful in jogging their memories. Um, so those are just a few strategies that I tend to use almost every time I do interview. Um, when I get more challenging cases and they really can't remember anything, um, I do like to ask them to maybe check their social media. Did they post pictures on Instagram or did they check in on Facebook anywhere? Um, I know I have a lot of friends and friend, uh, my friend's moms really like to check in when they go out to lunch and tag their friends. Um, very into the Facebook world. So uh, I like to ask my cases to go ahead and check their social media, um, see what they were up to or wh where they were at, what they were doing in that week before they got uh, ill. Or um, I know we're, we're asking a lot. We're already asking them to take time out of their day to answer our questions. Um, 
but I also really like to ask my cases, well, do you mind maybe checking your bank statement or going through some old receipts? Um, when I ask, I've actually never got any pushback on that. Um, a lot of times uh, when you explain up front why you're calling and why you're interviewing, um, they seem very willing to provide that information because they're, they don't want anyone else to get sick um, is what I tend to find. So I think that's also, also a really great option as well. Um, and some grocery stores have the apps on their phone so they can see, I know like, um, you know, Fry's has their, their list where you can go in and see what maybe coupons you saved or was on sale that week. Um, and maybe Mackenzie can touch on this, but I know she does a, a click list on Fry's, so I'm sure it saves um, like your order history that way as well. Uh, and a lot of times it's on your phone. So how easy is it for them to put you on speakerphone while they check a different app or log into a different app. Um, I also, when we're interviewing guardians of kiddos, a lot of times parents don't really know what their kids are eating at school. So I'll ask if it's possible to get a menu from the school. And most times parents are very willing to go ahead and provide that or even provide the school's name and, excuse me, They'll provide the school's name and um, you, know, you can go ahead and give the school a call and just ask what they're um, serving that week. Uh, so those are just a few strategies that I really like to uh, use while I'm interviewing. And I was hoping that you all would be willing to share some of your strategies when you get um, an interview with, that's a little reluctant to give you their food history. So I can share. Um, so in the past, what I have done when I get those people um, that basically have survived on air for forever, um, I will just kind of start naming foods, any foods I can kind of start thinking of off the top of my head, um, like in order. So, you know, other, other meat, like chicken, chicken wings, frozen chicken nuggets, like what about, or especially when it comes to fruit and vegetables, then it's just like apple, banana, pineapple, mango, like it's just a dictionary of food words, um, just to, to get anything. Um, and I will go off of not using what the, the questioner says, like a lot of times people may, maybe they really do only eat like goldfish crackers and dinosaur chicken nuggets and they're not realizing that chicken nuggets fall under the category of chicken for whatever reason they're just nuggets different food category obviously um <laughs> so that i have found in the past have been have been pretty helpful um the other suggestion is people they they really just don't maybe want to talk at that time so maybe trying to see if there's a better time has been something to do. For me, I'll usually ask for the quiet people uh, what they usually eat. Um, so if they do family dinners on Wednesdays at Golden Corral or just, or where do they, do they usually cook on the weekends or do you usually eat out on the weekend? And then that kind of helps guide them into restaurants that they may have eaten at um, during certain times. Or um, if they ate air for that whole time, we'll kind of go on with the survey and they'll when we're talking about unique exposures or anything else that you'd like to add. And they're like, oh yeah, I did have steak tacos. So I'll jump on it again. And so what do you have with those steak tacos? And then, okay, what do you have for lunch that day? So kind of just build off of, go, go with them wherever they go and kind of uh, filter through it that way. I think your suggestions were really good, Caitlin. Um, and I had a couple of thoughts while you were talking. Um, so, Sometimes we just need to remind the cases like, hey, I'm not in a hurry if you want to look something up. Just giving them the time and letting them know like, yeah, go ahead. Because if we give off the signal that we're rushed and that we really need this information, they may not feel like it's appropriate to take the time then, but certainly let them. Um, and then 
sometimes school menus are online, so that can be an easy way to find them. And then um, other times we've uh, had counties go through their environmental health to request menus from daycares. So that's another option for you as well. But I, I think the overall theme that we're getting at here, and this I've actually read some literature on, is creating a context for people. So if they're not thinking, what did I eat? Then ask them, what did you do that day? And that can help situate their mind to where they are. And then I thought of one more thing. Mary Lee got very excited a few weeks ago because she discovered that if you have a Fry's account and you log on, you, your entire shopping history is in your Fry's account. So um, a lot of times we'll go and request through our contact through Fry's, but if they're willing to log in and look at it, please have them do that. It's, it's not a secret information. It's available for, for anybody who uses their Fry's card. I that actually was a really exciting moment for me um, to see personally that I could see my own shopping records. And I also wanted to um, mention that how important those case notes are, you know, because we might know the person ate chicken, but we want to know more about what chicken they ate. We might know wanna, we might know they ate tomatoes, but we want to know what kind of tomatoes they ate. We're in the process of updating the way that the questionnaires look on the screen and on paper. And one of the things we want to do is make sure that there's lots of space for investigators to write details about the tomatoes or you know whatever the food exposure is. And then, um, like Demetria said, like what people usually eat is super helpful. A lot of times when we're doing outbreak investigations, we like to get an idea of what kind of eaters these people are. And we'll see signals from the uh, closed-ended food items, but we'll also see signals from the notes that the case investigator wrote that help us get a picture of what these people might have in common that'll allow us to dig a little deeper. And sorry, I talked over you, Alicia. I'm done now. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, I just sometimes I'll ask them to, like if they ate something out of the ordinary, like, hey, did you do something different that week that you normally don't do? And then like, uh, just also like products, um, like from Mexico too, just because we have the border. So I always ask them like, hey, did somebody bring you something you know like did somebody give you something or like you know especially with the ones where we asked the cheese and stuff like you know like what type of cheese was it or like did you get something like that that somebody brought over because we'll have you know people that tell us like oh yeah they brought me this cheese from like some like some state you know so i just just wanted to add that <laughs> Perfect. Well, I really want to thank you guys for sharing all of your strategies. I think it's a little bit better when we can all learn from each other instead of um, me just sharing with you. Um, I do have one more that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, so I recently was doing a focus questionnaire for a case that was really hard, difficult to get a hold of. Um, my schedule didn't match his schedule and we were playing phone tag and I really just thought he didn't want to do the questionnaire and didn't want to, um, not that he didn't want to give me the information, but he was just quite frankly all over the place. Um, and so I offered him the option of emailing me um, and that seemed to work out best for him. So he um, later in the day or evening uh, would go through his records and shoot me an email of what he ate and the exact dates. So it did take a lot longer to get the information from him, um, but that was that is an option if you guys have the time. Um, and again, just maybe write in your case management notes or in your case notes um, how the investigation is processing. And then here at ADH, ADHS, we can see that you're clearly working on it. Um, so he was able to finally, over a course of almost two weeks, um, you know, email me his records for. Um, the week prior to his illness and then I was able to finally um, nail down a time just to get him on the phone and ask him some follow-up questions um, so while that might be a little bit more time consuming at least you're getting the information and then one component from our DSO that I really just wanted to take the time to point out to you guys um, in specifically our salmonella questionnaire um, it says in the 
past or in the week prior to your illness, um, did you eat at a restaurant, uh, convenience store, and it lists all these different places. And then one of them is grocery store. And we're, we're really interested in finding out where they went grocery shopping in that week prior to, prior to their illness and what foods they purchased at that grocery store. Um, sometimes we just see a little bit of, um, I don't want to say misunderstanding, but we just get a, uh, some skewed information there. Um, but that is what we mean there if anyone had any confusion about that question. So I think that's all I have for you guys, um, and I'm excited to hear about the case interviews or case investigations we're going to do a little bit later on. I just want to, be... sorry. Yeah, go ahead. When I worked a, a salmonella case, I made the mistake of not um, keeping my notes updated so you guys could know what's going on as well. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yes, you know, I think that happens, you know, people maybe aren't getting back into medsys, um right when that sort of thing happens. We totally understand that. Sometimes we check in with people just because we want to make sure that there's not, you know, a, you know, misunderstanding about who the case is assigned to or, you know, sometimes we can offer assistance for finding cases. So, yeah, that definitely happens. Um, all right, we're going to move into can I, can I the... Interrupt? Oh, sure, yeah. I just wanted to add a couple of follow-up things on, on what you said, Caitlin. Um, I want to be explicit about what the grocery, uh, grocery store field and what often gets put in there. Um, oftentimes folks think that that means what did you eat while you were at the grocery store? Like if you had a sample of cheese or some kind of something they were um, giving samples of there. And while that's important, we do want to know where they actually grocery shop. And then I would caution you against asking about grocery, where they shopped in the week before, just because um, we really want to know everywhere they would grocery shop because there can be things that are like freezer safe that they may have gotten two months ago at a different grocery store that they occasionally go to. So I would really just ask that pretty broadly and say, where do you get your groceries from? Or if they were traveling and staying with a friend, you know, where does that family grocery shop? So that making sure that it's as broad as possible. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our uh, case investigation summaries. We have three today. So if you'll each take, you know, two or three minutes to kind of give an overview about what the interesting or challenging case was. And then if you have a question for the group about that investigation, we can discuss it. So let's go ahead and start with Demetria, if that's okay. Okay, so for mine, it was a Salmonella Javiana case and a six-year-old male. And he became ill, his onset was December 29th. And he had attended a camp around that time so my first thought was maybe something they ate at the kids camp it was held out of school uh, but his brother and his mother also became ill and the dates were kind of funky so the brother was sick on december 24th and then five days later the case had his onset and then three days later the mother had her onset so it's kind of scattered kind of strange uh, so i made sure to focus on shared meals well i tried to focus on shared meals uh, foods eaten at the camp, foods eaten before the camp, uh, and then family gatherings in case that played a role in, in everyone's illness. Um, so I kind of, the, with all the different information that, that I was getting, um, I was using a primary, the safer questionnaire that we use, just general for all cases, and then I use supplementary uh, questionnaire forms that we have to collect onset dates and date of births and foods eaten by each of the three ill people. And I just, it, I kind of had a lot going on. So I just, it kind of ended up being all over the place. Um, and I followed the mother because she was giving the account of what her son was eating, kind of where she went and was asking questions that I remembered from the questionnaire. And I, co I collected pretty much all of the information from the questionnaire. The, Thing, the question that I have for you all is when you have like a scattered storyline and you kind of follow the, the case where they're going instead of following the questionnaire, how do you make sure you're not leaving questions out 
Um, and then when you do, how do you handle calling back and collecting more information? Just because I've they, the case spends about 30, 20 to 30 minutes on the phone for this first in, for this initial call. And I can imagine they don't want five more calls with different questions that would get very frustrating. So as soon as I hung up the phone, I'm like, darn, I should have asked this question and this question. So I just, do you guys run into that and how do you handle it? Well, I think that's very normal to feel a bit overwhelmed when you're kind of getting a food history for three people at the same time. So, you know, two people at the same time is a challenge, but can be done. Three people at the same time, that can be really hard. So way to go on that. Um, I'll let others answer, but my, my thought is um, when I hang up the phone with someone, I'll say, you know, I occasionally have a couple of more questions. We got the bulk of it out of the way here, but I might call back, just have, you know, two or three questions so that they're aware that it'll probably be a short interview. I think Mary Lee's suggestion is perfect. I usually do the same thing as well when I end an interview. Um, and Demetria, I'm not sure if you have to fill out your the safer survey right away, um, but I think in cases where I'm getting food history for more than one person, I don't even use a printout questionnaire. I just have scratch paper. And um, whether it's like dividing columns and one side's one person, the other side's the other person, or having numbers. So number one be the mom, number two be the first case, or some, like a system that works for you. Um, but I, at that point, I just completely just scratch paper the whole entire way. And then you can always go back through your notes and fill in the questionnaires um, where it's appropriate. And that way you're not limited to that, um, to that survey on its own. Adding on, I think those are all the things that I would do as well. Um, I think I would first, it, you can tell when things are starting to get a little hairy. So I like at that point we'll say, okay, let's pause here. And I would either go a day at a time or a person at a time. Um, and it gets tricky because they want to be like, well, he ate that, but she didn't eat that. And then that's what we had together. And I want to say like, okay, I want to hear everything that everyone ate, not necessarily just those things that, you know, you all shared. So really making that explicit and continuing to remind them of that. Um, and then before you get off the phone, I would probably do a quick summary and be like, okay, just so that I avoid having to call you back or, or ask, taking up too much of your time, let me summarize my understanding. And I think you can catch some errors there. Obviously, it's not perfect. And I think it is totally normal to call people back and be like, hey, you know, sorry. And we've been actually pretty lucky with being able to text and just say like, hey, I want to clarify, did Joe eat that hot dog or not? <laughs> and, and that's an easy way for people to get around it. Okay. Um, one other thought, and I know this wasn't one of your questions, Demetria, but the first thought that came to mind when you described this scenario that there was a case ill and then five days later, another one, and then three days later, another one, I really think secondary transmission with that sort of scenario with salmonella because we typically see a one to three day incubation period. So a lot of times what we'll do is focus on the food history for the first ill case. Um, it doesn't mean that other cases couldn't have gotten sick from the same thing. Um, but when we have to choose, you know, which food history to focus on, getting that first ill case can be very helpful. And in fact, a lot of time, a lot of times in outbreak situations, we'll exclude from our analysis any cases that um, from the same household that were ill after the first case. Um, I commend you for getting a food history on all of them because that can be really, really helpful. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our next case summary. Um, Kayla, um, if you'd be willing to do yours. Uh, Kayla, looks like you're still on mute. You might have to unmute yourself on the phone and on the computer. So they just told me they only called in. Okay, if you just unmute your on the phone, then you know, even if you call in on the computer, you can mute and unmute yourself. 
so you may need to go ahead and unmute yourself on the phone as well or on the computer as well. Hello, can you guys hear? There we go. Yep. Yay. Progress. It's been a rough morning. All right, so I've only been doing investigations for maybe like a few weeks or so. Um, so the case that I worked on was probably one of my first enterics. She was an 88-year-old female uh, with Salmonella Montevideo. Um, it was a lab report. So when I first called her, I realized that she was hearing the results from me for the first time, which is usually hard from, for a lot of uh, cases when they don't hear it from their provider. Um, so. The first time she, we got a little bit of information of any pets and things like that she may have had in the house. But then after that, um, she had to go because her doctor's office was calling her and she told me to call her back in 10 minutes. I gave her a call back in 10 minutes and she didn't answer. So I left the voice message. Um, so the next day, uh, her doctor finally gave her the results and she, I called her and she called me back and she was, pretty interesting. Uh, the thing with her is there was no symptom onset date, so it was very hard. It was a urine culture, so it was very hard to sort of pinpoint uh, when you don't have any symptoms to go by, so that was one of the first challenges. And then the second challenge, um, she didn't want to complete the rest of the food history, and I kind of didn't want to push too hard because her exact response to me was, be glad that I called you back and I gave you the information that I gave you, um, but this is it. So basically when she talks to her nurse, um, she decided, um, she, well, when she spoke to the nurse, she, she remembered she had some chicken that she cooked in the microwave and she had some lemon water. So she was like, I got it from that and that's it. I just called to give you that information and I have um, nothing else for you. So I couldn't complete it, I couldn't get a history, but even if, like I said, you know, with no symptom on that day, it was very hard to even try to pinpoint. I mean, she's 88 years old. She had a whole lot of other stuff going on. So what I did with her was just listen. I let her talk. I mean, obviously, if we got off topic, I would try to redirect her, um, which didn't work very well. But at the same time, like I said, I, I just listened and got as much information as I could. Um, I just wanted to know, I mean, I did get a lot of great ideas from you guys, um, but basically, has anybody had a similar situation? How did you handle it? And just any strategies you have um, in regards to obtaining a food history for a person with no um, symptom onset date? Anyone from the group want to take that? Um, I had a case with no symptom on onset date. Um, they uh, claimed to be, they said they were, Ill, they've been ill for years, just consistent diarrhea for years, but there was a point in time where it got worse. And so that's, I ended up just using the time where it got worse or the diarrhea got a little more frequent or more watery as their onset date. Um, or I'll ask, sometimes a person knows they were sick, but they just can't pinpoint a day. So I'll ask um, if it was a weekend when they got sick and then, or I'll use the diagnosis date and I'll say, well, this is the day you had your test done. Um, did you get sick three days before that? Or were you sick for two weeks before that to kind of get a fit? So to help them get an idea of when they may have gotten ill. That's fantastic. Uh, generally, what we recommend with um, urines where, um, you know, it's a urine sample that was positive, you know, we ask, of course, about any changes to bowels or any diarrhea in the weeks leading up to that UTI. Often the answer is no, they didn't notice any change to their bowel. Um, if the answer is yes, then we go off of that date. But if the answer is no, then what we can do is ask a food history um, about the two weeks to a month before the onset of their urinary tract. Uh, infection symptoms. The reason we don't have a really great onset date or like ex exposure period for UTIs is because it can vary so widely. You know, this person can carry the bacteria in their bowel for a while with no symptoms and then it transfers over to the urinary tract. And, um, you know, it's just there's not a real good time frame. You know, with the onset of diarrhea, we know it's one to three days, it's well documented, but UTIs, it's just super wide. Um, so this is where it comes in, really helpful to know usual foods, what people typically eat, because we're getting a pattern of behavior that we can use in outbreak investigations. If there's a restaurant that they frequent, or, you know, if they have, you know, wing night, or pizza 
whatever, like Caitlin was suggesting, you know, those usual or typical um, patterns are very helpful. Anybody else have any tips for Kayla? Um, I did just want to mention one thing. In the past, um, and from experience working in a lab, just there's, there has to be a reason doctors don't like to just order stool or urine tests for no reason. So maybe trying to prod a little bit like, oh, well, what made your doctor decide to do a stool culture or what made them decide to do this? Because they're pretty reluctant to do them. So there must have been some signal. Um, and I can usually start with that information and kind of go from there. So that may be something to, to ask about. Yeah. To add on that, I always like if I don't have a like, especially with the urines, I will say like, hey, like you went into your doctor, like, did you feel off? You know, like, did you just feel not right? Like some people just, I've had some patients just complain of like fatigue and they're like, I felt more tired than normal. So then I'll just go off with that date and sometimes it would just feel weak or just very non-specific. So I'd rather just use that date than just kind of go, you know, kind of blind. <laughs> so I'll ask that. That's awesome. Perfect. Okay. Um, let's move on to our last case investigation summary, Erica Barrett. Okay. Um, so this is actually one of my more memorable cases because I, um, I usually just train the people in the lab, so I haven't interviewed a case in a while. So this one actually happened two years ago over the summer and it was a salmonella case. Um, it was a male um, who knew others ill who had eaten at the same restaurant um, and it was difficult to obtain a food history, um, but they had information on the names of restaurants and I must have had this man spell and say the name like five or six times because I didn't understand what he was saying. It was a weird name. I never heard it before. It wasn't, it wasn't even like a, um, like a, a restaurant, like a, a Mexican restaurant where I kind of understood like the Spanish words. Um, and um, that was good because it ended up, um, because I found out that name, there was another student in the lab who interviewed another person and they had the exact same restaurant and that ended up being um, linked to a larger outbreak that summer. So that was really cool. Um, <clears throat> the patient uh, was, he was really concerned because others were ill. And um, it was clear that no one had really been listening to him at that point. Like he had made a couple calls to um, his doctor and they had gotten lab results, but they weren't really helping him on trying to figure out where it was. So I think he was happy to talk to someone from the health department. Um, and uh, they were ready to go to court, so they had actually talked to their lawyer about it. So um, listening helped de-escalate the situation. Um, and they, he had a family member that was in the hospital still from getting sick, so um, he was kind of he was really distraught, and it was it was hard. Um, yeah. So my my question was um, basically when he originally got on the phone, he was really angry. Um, and uh, really, he was threatening to sue basically um, the restaurant or you know whoever it was who got him sick, and um, they were pretty sure it was that restaurant because everyone ate there and they all shared a common like appetizer. Um, so my question was, how do you like to de-escalate de this situation, or kind of what are your tips when someone's really like gung ho about suing someone or doing some kind of litigation? Has anybody had a similar situation, a really angry person on the phone? So I've never had anyone um, angry to the point of wanting to sue, um, but I, I've definitely had some, um, I, I don't, they just weren't very happy people. Um, but Erica, I think what you said, just listening, that goes such a long way and I think that we don't really um, value that as much. I know that as investigators, we're on the phone and we think we have a limited amount of time, we're working and we have other tasks we need to do. Um, but that just taking the time to listen and let them vent or let them get out their anger, uh, I find that that actually helps de-escalate the situation um, pretty well. Uh, and it sounds like that worked in your case as well. 
I've had some folks be pretty mad. Um, and I honestly struggle with what I'm allowed to tell them and what I'm not allowed to tell them. Because oftentimes in public health, we have a lot more information. Like, do you want to tell this person, well, you're not the only one who's gotten salmonella from this restaurant. Um, but it also sometimes becomes clear when we're asking questionnaires, asking about every food item on that menu, but not about the other restaurants that they ate at. So, you know, it's a fine line to know what to say to them. Um, and I usually find a way to agree with them and validate what they're saying without saying, yeah, go get them, let's sue them, let me give you some information. I usually say, we really hate to see these things happen. Um, and that's why we work to do our part of this to make sure that it doesn't happen again, because I know that that can be really frustrating um, when you're going to have a nice meal and, and certainly nobody deserves this. Um, and so you're really not encouraging them to seek legal action, but instead like trying to find a way to understand where they're coming from. Um, and of course we should never give legal advice or even, or any, anything of that sort, but I usually will just say, you know, some people do s pursue that. Um, we, can, we can't help you out, but I can help out by collecting this information. And, you know, if an attorney requests it, we're happy to provide all this information that you're sharing with us. And the more that you share, the more that it helps everybody in this same situation that you're in. So. Also, we have a training that will cover things like this that we would happy to, uh, we'd be happy to put on for your SAFER students. Yes, uh, I, that would be awesome. Okay. <laughs> I also wanted to say way to go, Erica, on really getting information about the name of the restaurant. Sometimes it's so easy if we don't understand what they're saying, just to say, oh, okay, and just move on. Um, but the fact that you had them spell the name and you don't got the name, that was probably a real key reason why we were able to find that um, outbreak so quickly. So, um, okay, we're coming up on the hour. I wanted to thank you all so much for being um, an integral part of season, season three of the collab. And we have really enjoyed spending this time with you, learning from you, hearing from you. Um, we are going to be sending out uh, an, a survey, a post, um, post season survey uh, to kind of assess pre and post um, how well you feel about your your skills in these areas. We also have some other trainings coming up. We um, I want to make sure everyone's aware of our Enteric Disease Investigator Network newsletter that gets sent out um, once a month. If you haven't been getting that, it comes from Gov Delivery. Let us know so we can add you in. We also have a foodborne task force meeting coming up soon for um, us to coordinate with environmental health and the lab and um, you know, different agencies about keeping food safe and investigating foodborne outbreaks. And we have our annual infectious disease conference coming up in July. Um, and then we hope to do um, this collab again. We'll, we'll probably um, be going to about once a year that people can use as a refresher um, or that new folks that are onboarded can use as part of their training. And any feedback that you have for us about what's useful or what we should tweak or change, let us know that's very useful. So um, with that said, thank you again, and um, we'll let you go and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Bye.